Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us this morning for our observance and celebration of Women's Equality Day and for the final day of the Maneuver Center of Excellence Centennial Leadership, Leadership Symposium. It is my pleasure this morning to introduce today's first speaker, Major General Gary M. Brito, the Commanding General of Fort Benning and the Maneuver Center of Excellence. Major General Brito gradu graduated and was commissioned in the infantry from Penn State University in 1987, has served in every leadership position from platoon leader to commanding general in both peacetime and war. As you would expect, his assignments, experiences, and awards are extensive and can be viewed in your program. As our commanding general, I could think of no leader more worthy to speaking to all of us this morning about the importance of leadership and its application in both our careers and our lives. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in a warm welcome for our commanding general, Major General Brito. I think he said commission in 1987, so this is maybe my centennial birthday almost. Tony, thank you very much. Mayor Tomlinson, thank you so much for joining us this morning. That would be our, Mrs. Tomlinson will be our keynote speaker on women's equality, and man, we're very thankful to have you here, and very honored to have you in our presence as well. Ladies and gentlemen, I have some repaired marks, but as usual, I'm going to go totally off script today. I like to just talk to you, and I would prefer some questions and answers. And more importantly, I don't have any slides, if that's okay with you. Hey, guys, first of all, again, it's very, very much an honor to, to culminate this week, this leadership week. It is indeed very, very important. And I know for some, especially for those who may have just joined the Army, you can see it and say it may be a dry subject in many ways. But I can tell you, and more importantly for the leaders in the audience, you can attest to this, and please be my phone or friend as we go into the questions and answers uh, for those who have been in for a while. It is de very much the leadership, leadership is the cornerstone of what we do. We do have many standing in the back. There's some open seats up here, so please feel free to take them. If you want to, of course, you, you don't have to. But what I would like to do quickly, just so I understand who we're speaking with today, of course, I know all the commanders and the lovely spouses, uh, how many lieutenants in the audience? How many of you were here the other day when I spoke to you? Good, so I can tell some lies and you won't know about it, right? <laughs> okay. How many OCS, any? Captain's Career Course? And of course, all the battalion commanders and cadre, I know all of you all as well. Uh, I'll start with something, an experience I had, an experience I had just, uh, I guess, a week or two ago. And had an opportunity to speak with some young professionals going into public service in the state of Georgia. And they were going through a, a program called the Zell Miller Leadership Foundation. And we did some research to understand what that was. And Zell Miller was a distinguished businessman and leader in the state of Georgia. And he started this foundation uh, in 2004. And the intent was not to gain profit, but to really share some leadership experiences and develop the leadership skills of those going into public service some for nonprofit, some for profit organizations. You understand what public service is. None of them were in uniform. Uh, some had served in the military, some served <coughs> in military families, and mo most of them were much younger than we are. But they had a call to service and a call to service to work in public service in the state of Georgia. Quite frankly, I had not heard of the program before, obviously being, being back to the state, uh, state of Georgia after several years. But after doing some research, I very much, very much believed and what it was trying to do to develop some of the leadership skills of the, of the public servants. Uh, they ranged anywhere from 19 years old. We had some, I think, in the 40s and 50s, but most, most were younger than I am. And most were the age of the commanders in this room today. Uh, but what I found out in speaking to them, that although I was the only guy wearing this funky blue uniform called ASUs, not funky, of course, that's my bad joke for the morning. I'm authorized three, so that's one. I'm going to keep a tally. Uh, but in talking to them, what I did find out, many of the principles of leadership that we honor in the military are the same that they honor in public service as well. And there was one real big challenge, so I'd like to talk to you today also, uh, that should be near and dear to all the leaders in the room, especially those that are just joining the Army now, going through your respective bullet course or your captain's career course. That was simply the ability to influence others, inspire others, and get them to do what you need them to do. And I want to get your thoughts on this. I'm giving you some time to prime up your thoughts and questions before I introduce Mayor Thomas here for the Women's Equality. But in talking to them, we did identify one thing, and I'll share this with the lieutenants now, and the commanders and command sergeant majors know this for sure. In the military, we have one form of legitimate power. 
and I'll use it for own power because we have rank. And even though your subordinates may not like you, and hopefully they do, or may not respect you, and hopefully they do, uh, your spoken word does give you some legitimate expert power <laughs> do this because I said so. And I will offer up to you that is probably not the form of leadership that you want to go across your organization. I'll share that with the lieutenants now, the captains, and those in battalion command because of your previous experience and sergeant majors as well, you know that. Uh, so you do want to inspire folks to do what you want to do, whether that's through a very good and effective command climate. And please trust me, you will never know, never know, how far an effective, positive command climate will take you. Folks will want to follow you. Folks will be inspired by your leadership. Folks will want to tell you, hey, sir, I know you think A, but we're not going to get here. Here's B. And they will want to succeed for your organization. And I will offer up to you, uh, personally, over my many years of experience, and, and uh, equally with those in the audience today, if you can attain that and people want to follow you because they're doing the right thing and they want to help you succeed, you got a good thing going on. And I'm not saying that in a self-promoting way whatsoever, because I've learned it the opposite way as well. But that is indeed how you want to influence folks to follow you, influence folks to help you execute your mission and your vision as well. Now, there are times where it is black and white, and there will be times where, hey, I told you to do this, execute, and I will just offer up, please do explain uh, the task and purpose of what you're doing, explain your mission, and explain your vision. And commanders, I'm looking at you in the front row, I'm gonna tee you up on a question soon uh, to help, help point a friend and help talk to this a little bit. I do wanna shift focus just a little bit and talk about three characteristics. And many of you heard these before, probably for some, for, from some other speakers. Uh, personally, I had the privilege of sitting through a professional development forum with the current AMC commander, General Gus Perna. He talked about three things which stuck in my mind and obviously, if you, if you were to rewind the, the many years of your careers uh, for some of, the, some of the audience today, I would tell you that these three things really started to be developed, in some cases not developed, back at home. Before you joined the military, while you were in high school, on your kitchen table, working with your coach, going to church, or something like that. Character, competence, and he used the word courage as he talked about it. I've also heard others, in this case, it was the chief of staff, talk to character, competence, and candor. Now, this is when I'm gonna ask for some audience assistance. Anybody that's under the rank of major, how would you define cap uh, character? Boy, he's sure <coughs> the rank of major, what do you think? Please sit down. There's a combination of not only Everybody hear that? Oh. Basically an awesome answer. That's why you're now a colonel in one morning. Okay. It was great. But indeed, the, the character is something that, indeed we, that we need to have. And I'm not going to sit here and read a, a, a textbook de definition to you, a Webster de de definition to you. But the character of the soldier, the character of the leader, and the character of the person is key. And you really shouldn't expect others to emulate you or follow you if you have a weak character, quite frankly. Uh, very much so tested more if we go into combat. I'm trying to shift away from the big light here. Uh, as we go into combat, but the character of the person is, is critical. Uh, when times are hard, when it's hard to make a decision, when resources may not be there, or when the, the, it is easy to do the wrong thing and harder to do the right thing, the character of the leader will, will motivate and inspire, in my opinion, others to follow you and, and, in essence, allow you to achieve your leadership and influence others to do the things that you need to do. How about any lieutenants back there? What are your thoughts on character and how, how was it developed? Do you think you're going to learn it in Bullock totally? Or was it something that you had uh, when you joined the Army? I'm going to point at one in a minute. Who wants to raise a hand? Uh, sorry, ma'am. Please sit down. You see how I influenced and inspired her? <laughs> that was awesome. Going back to your question, sir, you said that character, were you asking if it was mm. developed over time? Yeah, what do you, what do you think? Do you do, is it something you joined before you came in? Were you just born with it in innate? Was it developed? So, well, there's several theories that revolve around that. However, I believe that 
character is developed over time, but you set the pace on that. Mm -hmm. You can exhibit a, I would say like a cop out of character, something that has appeal, has candor, and people will lead it. They'll they'll even follow it. But at the same time, if you can't exhibit the type of integrity where you can look at yourself in the mirror at the end of the day and mm -hmm. be totally honest with yourself, then I think that's basically your measure of character. Yeah, I think that's a great answer. Another uh, mentor of mine who's, who's now retired also used the, the term, to, and you, and you talked to it, was to be able to pass the mirror test. Mm -hmm. So if you make a decision, whether it's good, good or bad, and you may not know what the outcome of the decision would be, and without going into de details, this was the decision he made. It did not have a good outcome, uh, career-wise. Uh, however, it was, it was the right ethical decision to make. Uh, he said, I passed the mirror test and felt good with it. So whatever the outcome would be, if you can pass the mirror test and feel good with it, I, I concur. Uh, <coughs> you're settled with your character. Uh, but if you have a character flaw and that you're dishonest sometimes or, or disloyal to both your troops when you, or, or your, or your uh, superiors as well, mm -hmm. your soldiers will pick up on that in about three and a half nanoseconds, yeah. probably before some of your peers will. Uh, and then if that happens, you're followed by fear or you're not followed at all or, or you're, you have a, a lack of a, a inspiration or ability to influence others. So you, you just have a plain problem. Mm -hmm. And quite frankly, for the majority in this room, and I would say extend the same, uh, the same oath to our non-commissioned officers. When you raise your right hand and took that oath, you are in essence signing up that you'll have a character of, of no flaw. That does not mean that you need to be the mini-me and, 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 and not be you. I'm not, picking on, I'm not picking on you personally. But please do know who you are and uh, identify the flaws. And that's kind of, uh, it touches on another point I would like to bring up as well. And I did share this with a recent commissioning class at a, another another university in another state, I don't need to talk about what it was, but uh, the importance of, of seeing who you are and self-actualizing and understanding your strengths and your weaknesses. <laughs> and I'll offer up, especially for the company, uh, company level officers here, it is very, very important before I go into competence to understand the weaknesses and how you can fix them, whether it's a personal flaw, a speech flaw, or a writing competency, or physical training of something, please do self-actualize and say, hey, in order for me the best, to be the best leader that I can possibly be, here are some things I may need to work on. You may receive that feedback from somebody, like a spouse, a cousin, or a battle buddy. And if you don't have one of those folks in your life to give you some feedback, I would recommend that you do, whether married or not. Or just have the courage to do the mirror test and say, hey, this did not go all that well for me. Why and how can I work on it? That why may be the communications, communication skills. That why may be I need to pass the two mile or the new ACFT and I can't. Or something. But self-actualize and don't just push it aside because if it hinders you from being the best leader you can be for the soldiers that you've taken <coughs> to take care of, you're going to continue to have a problem. And I would also say the flip side of that is something's going very well for you. And you're the type of person who can speak well with others, communicate with others, excuse me, take care of soldiers, that's a strength as well that you should continue to polish, but share that with the soldiers and leaders underneath you to help to continue to build capacity for the Army. Can I get a hold so far? Oh. Is everybody awake? Oh. Do we need to do some side straddle hops? Oh. Do we even do side saddle hops anymore? No. Half jacks? Nope. Nope. Okay. Should I do burpees? Yeah. That ain't going to happen, don't worry about it. <laughs> okay, that's two jokes, you keep them tally? Don't, don't turn me in, okay? All right. Competence. Talk about one more character. One after this. Uh, let me see, who could I pick on today? Scott Poole, I've known you for 15 years. Just about, right? Your definition of competence, sir. Uh, the ability to accomplish your mission, whether it be tactical or technical. Regardless of what you're assigned, your ability to get it done. He read that at FM what? FM Scarpula, right? <laughs> cool. Everybody pretty much heard what he said? So know your stuff, learn your stuff, know the tactics and some of the technical things involved with it. Couldn't agree with him more. And I, being a little biased for those in the combat arms and armor and infantry, which is probably everybody in this room, and then some others, but that's even more key in the specialties that we have. So a level of competence commensurate with the skills that they're giving you and commensurate with what your soldiers and subordinates will expect of you as well. Now I am going to put a little underline on that as also. 
I personally would not expect a platoon leader or the company commander of the first sergeant to be as sharp as a high-speed, well-polished sergeant who's been doing this since he went through AIT. For example, the M249 machine gun or something, where a good soldier who shoots it all the time, qualifies expert all the time, could probably assemble and disassemble it blindfolded at night. That's the expertise he or she should have if he's the owner of that, that platform. I'm not actually expecting the platoon leader to do the same, but I expect you to know how to employ it. I expect you to have the, the competence to work the tactical pieces, the technical pieces, just like Colonel Scarpula said. Something that you would and you should work on, and your soldiers and leaders will expect it of you. So I'm going to find another lieutenant in the room. What are your thoughts on that? We got one from the old colonel back here. Any IOBC guys? Oh, correction, correction. Ibola guys, sir. So, sir, to build off of what you were saying previously, so um, competence goes along with character. If character is like that tree and the taproot is that virtue and nobility, competence is like the pruning of the tree to ensure that it still bears fruit. So those things you need to work on, those expertise, your writing skills, the things that soldiers look at you as a leader to reflect so that they can emulate it. Um, so competence is staying green enough that you continue to grow you practice, you practice, you practice, so that when it comes time to execute, your soldiers know that you are competent enough to lead them in those skill sets. And you'll have trust in your competence and trust in your decisions as well. That was a great answer. Did somebody write that down? I want to publish that. That was really good. Are you in an Ebola class now, an Ebola? Ebola. On your way to Distinguished Honor Grad? Uh, I start uh, in, the next, in two classes. Oh, so not only do we have character, we have confidence as well, right? I like that. No, but that was a great answer. And I think everything you said is spot on. And I'm not picking on you anything, but I think everything you said is spot on. And one, not only understanding all the technical aspects of whatever skill set you're working with, but your leaders and your subordinates, more importantly, should expect for you to have total confidence in what you're going to give them or whatever the respective mission is going to be. So I totally agree with you. Don't need to beat it up anymore. But what I will add to the competence piece, and for those that are in the respective bullocks now or the career course, and the commanders and sergeant majors to my front have gone through this, continue to study, study, study. I'm not just doing the foot stomp for the instructors here, but it's very important to be well-grounded in the basic tactics uh, that support what you're doing, and to be able to comfortably speak to the doctrine of the respective uh, uh, mission that you may have, and understand the procedures as well, if. If, if there's not doctrine to back it up. I will uh, kind of touch on something that came from a, out of our chief of staff just yesterday, quite frankly. I was up in the Pentagon for a totally unrelated, unrelated to what we're talking about today, sort of, uh, briefing. And he talked about developing agile and adaptive leaders, which is not a new buzzword. I know you've heard this for years. But the big takeaway team, and I want to tie it to the current operational environment, I'm kind of going on a tangent here, is we could be deployed anywhere. And granted, you know as much as I do, not as many soldiers deployed in, in, in multiple countries as they were about six or seven years ago, but I do not think uh, the deployments are going to stop anytime soon. They may be small on scale, but I don't think they're going to stop any, anytime, too, anytime soon. Excuse me. I do think that we'll continue to be in places like Afghanistan, Iraq, at least for the short term, possibly places in the Pacific, possibly places in Northern Europe. My point, team, <coughs> is that we could probably be called to go anywhere at any time. And if you are not the leader that can be adaptive and agile, comfortable and with the ambiguity, you're going to have a challenge. And that kind of ties to the competence. That kind of ties to your, your, lack, your, your level of character, your level of leadership, and your ability to take the ambiguity and make, it, so make, it, make things work. Does that make sense to you so far? Oh. Okay. I've been giving you 20 minutes to think of some questions because I'm going to stop in a moment. I'm going to check my notes real quick. Okay, I'm going to skip all the other stuff I wrote down and talk about one other one. And I really do want to focus this point towards the company grade officers. And I may phone a friend for the Lieutenant Colonels and Sergeant Majors and above. This I am saying from a perch of being a little bit older than some in the room. And I cannot put enough passion behind the comment I'm going to say right now. Okay, I, I personally fully expect you all to continue to train as hard as you can train. And please, and these are my words, understand the oath that you took when you got commissioned. And I'm focusing this on the lieutenants and the captains right now. 
um, because one, Lieutenant Colonel's the sergeant majors and the majors have already been through this. But whether you have deployed or whether you're going to deploy, and it may be many years. Personally, I didn't deploy until I made major, senior major, major promotable, quite frankly. Uh, it may very well happen, and you need to be prepared for that. If you're here in the Army of the Infantry or any of the, any of the combat arms, we have one mission. And these may not be the exact words out of doctrine, but that's to be ready for the crucible of combat. And I'm stealing those words from the Chief of Staff. And to be able to deploy in combat, whether we like it or not. That may very well happen. I think it will if we stay in long enough, or you may go many, many, many years and not deploy at all. But be ready for it. And I don't say this in a doom or gloom way, because you could have lots of fun in the Army, and you should, and you, and you will. But be ready for combat. That's why you're in combat arms. Period. Be ready to give your soldiers of all ranks, ethnicities, and creeds the best leadership you can possibly give. And I will quote a parent that I've seen in a previous setting, is that they're putting trust and faith in you to take care of the soldiers. In training, in combat, or whatever. Take care of the soldiers. And that should weigh on your shoulders a little heavily but not in a bad way, because you are ready for it. And I know this institution and your experiences and your relationship with your non-commissioned officers will ensure that you're ready for it. So to peel it back a little bit, all the basic blocking and tackling in whatever your respective skill set, in whatever job you're in at the time, whether it's a support platoon leader, a mortar platoon leader, a company XO, an extra duty as an NBC officer, embrace it. Embrace the hell out of it. If it was good when you got it, make it better. Have true passion for what you're going to do. Have true passion for every single soldier in your command. Be able to learn, and some of the battalions, more senior guys can talk to this, the balance of leadership. Leadership laterally and horizontally. Understand at what level you're at, how much you should focus your leadership down to your soldiers, down to your families and up to support your battalion commanders and command sergeant majors as well. And to bring it up a couple ranks, you know, for the lieutenant colonels and the colonels and the command sergeant majors in the rank, you're in the, in the ranks, your level of uh, balance of leadership will change based off the position that you're in as well. It may be more 60-40, where 40% leading down to my troops. Because underneath you, you have guys like these making things happen. And then balance of leadership up, supporting your commanders, on their vision, their mission, their strategic goals, and their objectives. Does this make sense so far? I'm, I'm not, I, I realize I'm probably putting a damper on this, but I'm not. I'm a really happy guy, believe it or not. <laughs> but I'm actually going to take this unheard of thing called CG leave in about 50 minutes from now. So, well, my point is to bring it up a little bit, team. I do have a heck of a lot of passion <laughs> for what I do and for what you do as well. But in our mission, specifically in the combat arms, there's probably no one bigger characteristic, more important than everything, than your level of your ability to lead, influence others, inspire others, motivate others, and take care of others. And if you have a deficiency or lacking in character, lacking in candor, lacking in competency, your ability to lead will just not go well. My opinion, for what it's worth. Whether well, that's attribution or non-attribution, hopefully non-attribution. I won't go on Facebook this morning, I hope. Uh, but I think many, many can agree. Okay, with that, I'm going to pause. I do have some time to take some questions. I'll take any questions that you may have on any topic that you may have. If I can't answer it, I'll phone a friend or write it down and get an answer. Uh, but for the, those more senior in the audience, I couldn't say how I'm, I'm extremely, extremely proud, one, to be working with you for all that you do every, every, every day. I've shared this with many of you before. And for those younger than, uh, well, Captain on down in the audience, I'm extremely proud of what you're doing as well. And have been in your position, although not in this auditorium, and we have black boots, increased BDUs, but it was the same tactics, the same training, just different numbers, okay? So to rehash things, you have to be great of, a great leader of character, a great person of candor, and give the very, very, very best leadership that you can give to your soldiers and their families. And that's what they all expect of you, and I do as well. I'll pause for any questions. Ma'am.
Hey, sir. Hi. So, I actually was talking to my dad about this yesterday. He retired. In about me? No, not about you. <laughs> You're getting scared for me. But, sorry. No, I'm just kidding. You know, That's I three jokes. I scare my dad. So, <laughs> so, um, so he retired in 2006, and he served with um, the 10th group. Okay. And, you know, we were, I was actually talking to him about a project that I'm working on with my working group, um, actually for Colonel Voorhees. And, um, you know, we were, we were talking about, like, the 10 common mistakes that leaders often do. One of my favorite ones out of that list was misdiagnosing the scope of a problem. And usually that involves the scale of something. So as we were talking, um, I told my dad, I said, you know, Dad, like, you can study the heck out of a problem. You can know it so well, and I do that a lot um, with my job. The issue that I'm running into is finding solutions, though. I often find quick solutions, solutions that, you know, hey, it's a temporary fix, but it often misdiagnoses the problem because of the scale of it. So I'm asking, um, with your experience, uh, what is something that you fall back when you come into an obstacle like that? What is something that you use to basically figure out, okay, you know what, this is my foundation, and this is where I'm gonna build off of when it comes to finding the solutions mm -hmm. um, in regards to a problem that may be bigger than yourself? Yeah, you know, that, that is a superb question. And one, thank your dad for his service. Okay. And, and really it. that <laughs> issue, and, and then having the, the family time to talk through that type of problem. So that, that's a great issue. I would tell you personally, and, and it's just something that's developed over time, and I do say this personally as well, as a much younger officer, knowing I was an introvert, believe it or not, at the time, uh, you do believe that, right? <laughs> uh, thinking that you had to solve, the, that I had to solve the problem by myself, and that was not uh, always most effective. And what it led into was a misdiagnosis of the problem, especially if you know, or if you soon identify that the scope of it is bigger bigger than you, or your decision may lead to outcomes that just perpetuate the problem, uh, which, which could be the case. So what I would offer up, and I have learned this over time as well, is to do pause a little bit. Uh, we, we do a lot of great crisis management in the Army, and we do here at MCO as well. But there are times where you can sit back and breathe and think about the problem. Don't, don't spend too much time admiring the problem, because admiring the problem is not the solution, although sometimes we think it is but sit back and breathe. But what I personally found over time, and I would say throughout positions, <coughs> is that sometimes committees or other people can help you see things differently to understand the scope of the problem and, and incrementally build a solution for the problem. It could be something very simple like, you know, what, what, a PT formation, or it could be something very complex that has multiple second and third order effects that you just may not see yet. So to give to, I'll just mic one up. You have a, let's say you're working a very complex issue now for Colonel Voorhees, I'm not sure, and you may very well with the old transformation and other things, is perhaps bring some others in that have no background knowledge like you do, so they'll do a very fresh analysis of it, and I have no idea what the problem is, but it'll give a very fresh set of eyeballs to the situation. I know the experience is to lay some solutions on the table. Uh, or you may task some things out and say what you don't know. I, I'll, kind of a tangent, Man, I'm, I'm probably taking way too much time, but I'm sorry. Uh, kind of a tangent is uh, we had a battalion S2 that says, sir, here's what I know, here's what I think, and here's what I don't know. And all the energy went to what I think and what I don't know. And brought in some red team players and some others to look at the problem freshly, say, hey, did you pick up on this? No, I didn't. Or if I make decision A, the old per diagram, here are the, the second and third order, third order impacts of it to help you see the scale. And secondly, uh, and I did see this in myself as a younger officer, and even so now, is to say, hey, realize I don't have the solution. I need to ask for help. And that could be through a staff officer, uh, or a specialist like an officer type guy who's smarter than you, or someone outside the organization. Hey, what do you think about this? Uh, and lastly, I would say, and sometimes with the crisis management we have, especially as a tactical issue, which you may not have a lot of time, is to ask for time <coughs> if you need more time to get it right. Because a bad decision done with poor timing just keeps on rolling and it causes more problems. I don't know if that helped at all, but seek, seek support, breathe first, <coughs> uh, seek outside voices or, or, or brains to help you analyze something. And it could be a formalized red cell or something to that effect, but, but the assistance is there. 
and, and lastly, and I'll probably talk to guys like your dad. Hey, dad, what do you think? We'll all get into classified issues. They can give you some assistance as well. Does that help at all? That was a great question. I appreciate that. I don't want to take too much of the mayor's time, so I can t probably take four or five more, and we'll go from there. <laughs> or six more. Twelve o'clock. Sir, you've got one. Okay. Oh, sorry? Okay. I apologize. The, the light's in my face. Go ahead. Morning, sir. Uh, Lieutenant Anderson. You can uh, sit question, down, Anderson. Uh, I'm actually the mic carrier, Whoa. too, so okay. <laughs> no one had a question, so I decided to I was wondering why you had the mic so privilege. fast. Go ahead. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, this question is a little bit above my pay grade, but something that... Um, going through is it about your pay grade uh, above my pay grade oh, can't but, help you there so uh, within OCS and, and getting ready for Iabolic we've been seeing a lot of the focus going from coin to the peer-to-peer -peer thread yeah uh, but it seems that you know failure is one of the greatest teachers one of your greatest learning experiences after all the blood and treasure we've spent in Afghanistan and Iraq it seems like we might be losing that institutional knowledge from coin especially given the nature and if you look at Syria as a laboratory that proxy wars are still going to be that peer-to-peer -peer interaction. It's going to be through essentially insurgents on both sides that are being funded. So I'm just wondering as an organization, how are we going to retain all that hard fought, you know, through failure and through victory, that institutional knowledge there? Yeah. Well, no, that's a great question as well and something a lot of senior leaders discuss also. And I'm going to start at this end and walk it back. You can maybe sit down if you want to, but I know you're the mic man getting paid extra money for that. <laughs> Uh, our, our training and doctrine command headquarters and others as well, as well have redefined, rightly so, what we think the current and future operational environment is going to be. And it is not so much going to be won by what, what you may know as standard coin counterinsurgency operations, <coughs> although an aspect of it may very well be. So that is why a lot of what you're being taught, what we're being taught now, both in the institution, at the combat training centers and other places, are more focused on decisive action or scenarios that may be in dense urban terrain, or scenarios that are within the multi-domain operations of cyber, EW, and all that other stuff, which in some small aspects may involve some counterinsurgency operations, but it involves a lot more than that, of which we, as agile and, think, agile and adaptive leaders, need to be able to, to work in our doctrine, our techniques, our deployments as, a joint, as part of the joint force will fight in that type of environment. So to walk it back a little bit to specifically to your question. I would argue just a little, well, disagree a tad bit. Within the ranks, yes, you know, guys who have retired or moved on to different positions, who've been there and done that, got four or five t-shirts in the early days of the desert, that institutional knowledge is gonna disappear a bit as these leaders and soldiers leave the force. That's gonna happen, as it has with every generation. But I can also say, guys that are still in, who have you know, something stuck back in their brain and know how to do it and can adapt either way, uh, we formally have kept a lot of lessons learned. We formally have saved old doctrine as well that can be polished off and the dust taken off to adapt to our, to our current situation. I would not say that we've thrown away coin, although we've, we're adapting from it into this decisive, too decisive action with our current OE operational environment. And it definitely will have a place in some aspects of what we fight. But I do think that the future OE operational environment is probably a little bit different than 2003, 2004 was, was as we entered Baghdad, if that makes any sense to you. Yes, sir. Okay. I hope that was helpful, so it is balanced. Some stuff is archived. We do lose experience in the ranks, but I, I will also say things I learned in Officer Basic course 30 years ago would apply as well to, the, to what you guys face today. I hope that helped. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Any others? Okay, yes, please. Good morning, sir. I'm a big believer that without the people wearing the uniforms, the Army would be billions and billions of dollars worth of junk. And so my question, sir, is what is your advice for uh, young leaders that uh, you know, are struggling to, to achieve uh, commitment and buy-in, both from subordinates and uh, their, their leaders, <coughs> their senior leaders? Young leaders, could you go do that one more time for me, please? Yes, sir. The, I'm seeking your advice for young leaders. Uh-huh. Uh, that are facing challenges with commitment and buy-in from their subordinates okay. and also from their leaders. Okay, that, no, that, that's a, a big dilemma, uh, and I think we all have done it. I would, and, and I'm, I'm going to ask you for a friend as well after I give you my thoughts from some of the commanders that have been for a while, but gaining the buy-in or acceptance from your subordinates, and, and I'll just, just say you're right platoon leader, I'll make that up. Are you one? Well, what, what do you do now? Uh, EO advisor. EO, EO advisor? Okay, what, 
So I won't talk about that specifically, but whatever formation that you're in, uh, time and opportunities and experiences, just some time with your folks, and I'll just, for, for sake of illustration, say a platoon or a company, time with your guys in situations where they have to see you as a leader make decisions, uh, take care of them, be human. You'll get buy-in and you'll get acceptance from your guys. Now, part of the challenge you may be talking to is getting folks to, to, to if you have a challenge convincing the importance of your mission or, or your vision, that, that is one. And how do you sell that? You really got to just sometimes deploy, I hate to say that as much, or continue to train or show them the value of everything that you are doing. As an example, if you are a, a rifle company commander, they'll see the value of, of why you're really, really training hard and changing the task and conditions when they get tested or when you get tested. Uh, they'll see the value of, of your leadership. And if you make a bad decision in leadership, fess up to it. You know, and work with your subordinates as well. And then outside of all that, if there's time to, time to take care of your soldiers through organizational days or other venues, do that also. So we'll see the human side of it. But never, comp with, with all that, being a human and taking care of folks, please don't compromise the oath that you've taken. Uh, never compromise ethics, loyalty, and integrity. Never compromise that. Because more, and, and, um, as a senior leader, officers especially, since you've taken an oath, all those have to be have to be done and are very, very important. <coughs> and then also share the aspects of a profession of arms. Now I'm not just sharing that as a bumper sticker, but please do tell your soldiers of all ranks, hey, you are better than the institution. You are better than some of the the, the, the bad things as as an organization in life. You are in a profession of arms. So you are expected so to be professional. You've taken an oath, you signed a contract, we have we have values that guide all that we do. And in sharing that with time with your folks, uh, I think you'll continue to get the buy-in. Now, above, and you're in a, I'll, I'll pick the position that you're in now as an EO advisor. Uh, your superiors, rightly so, uh, should observe you, uh, ensure that you're doing things to standard, uh, that you have a level of loyalty, loyalty and commitment to get it done right. And I think that buy-in and, and uh, appreciation will be gained over time as well. I got a sense I'm dancing around your question, but not answering it well. Uh, did that make any help at all? Yes, sir. Can I phone a friend or one of my colonels here, or Sergeant Major Celestine? Will put your commitment on display, which will help people buy into that culture that you're trying to push. Hey team, I'll take one more because I don't want to, as I mentioned, cheat the time of our keynote speaker uh, for today. However, with that one question, I will publicly say now, I'll offer myself up anytime. I want to come back and speak to your, to your groups at any venue. Well, my team will get mad you can come by the office as well. <laughs> okay? I really, this is, this is a, I mean, I really, really just love the, love the Army. I, I sincerely do. And I really love all aspects of leadership as well and have learned from it. Uh, but with that, I can't tell you, everybody in this room, you are the pacing item. I know some of us may drive a tank or Bradley or Humvee, but it's about the human, kind of like you suggested in your question from the soldier, the soldier you lead, that is the true pacing items of what we do. So with that, I'll, I'll, I'll be sure to come down and talk to you. Okay, I went totally off script team, so I hope uh, the, camp, the discussion may have helped just a little bit. Uh, if nothing else, remember a nugget or two as you go through the ranks, uh, because someone in this room will be the next ARTB commander one day. Someone in this room will be the next Maneuver Center of Excellence commander one day, or the proponency Command Sergeant Major. Please trust me on that. Uh, but never, never go back in the contract that I gave you, which is not formal, of taking care of soldiers and gaining and keeping the trust of those parents who entrusted you to take care of their troops. Oh, oh, oh. All right. Total shift here, team. Okay? I have the distinct honor, and it is with great enthusiasm, that I get to introduce Mayor Teresa Tomlinson. She was elected as the 69th <coughs> mayor of Columbus, Georgia, November 30th of 2010, with an overwhelming vote. 
Ma'am, it is indeed our honor for you to spend some time with us today. Uh, gentlemen, ladies, you can read our accolades, you can read our bio, but again, it is my honor to introduce Ms. Teresa Thomason. Thank you. Team, thanks for your time. Appreciate